Uh, we're just uh, continuing on with our third presentation for Section 4B. Thank you very much for being here. Thanks to the organizers for the great job. I'm Pavlos Antoniadis. I'm a pianist, musicologist, and technologist. Uh, at the moment, I'm invited researcher at IRCAM. And the work uh, you are going to see has been carried out not only at IRCAM, but also at the University of Strasbourg, Labex Graham. The title of uh, my talk today is Playing Without Mental Representations. GESTCOM, a system for the optimization of embodied interactive learning of complex piano notation through adaptive multimodal feedback. And just to unpack a bit this long title, how can we outsource mental representations to embodied interaction with symbols and technology in the most complex instances of piano music? I'm going a bit to the different direction than <laughs> the previous talk. Um, and why deal with complex music eventually? Because it explicitly problematizes representability, computability, and predictability of aesthetic results. In human-computer interaction, there is a whole domain which refers to extreme users in extreme situations. I want to deal with representation-hungry tasks, not the usual minimally cognitive behavior. And eventually, I don't refer to complexity as a new complexity composer's fetish but I want to extend my conclusions back to mainstream repertoire and essentially to any musical interaction with or without notation because I consider musical interaction as a dynamic phenomenon. Oops. So uh, this talk is articulated in two parts. In the first, I'm dealing with complexity. I'm giving a revised notion of complexity. Then. I'm explaining that this revised notion invites embodied interaction with symbolic notation in lieu of the classical notion of interpretation. And I'm dealing with the hot potato of representation. I'm showing why this embodied interaction model problematizes representation. And in the second part, I will show you the interactive systems we have been developing at IRCAM, namely this GESTCOM system I'm mentioning in the title. And this structure of the talk can be uh, summarized in the following epistemological claim, that complex piano performance can be better explained as embodied interaction with symbolic notation, adapted for direct perception and action through interactive systems without mental representations, or at least with contingent use for mental representations. Of course, nobody anywhere would ever claim that mental representations don't exist or don't emerge during our practices, but this is an epistemological as opposed to an ontological claim. So I'm making a, cl a claim about how can we better understand or study a phenomenon, not what a phenomenon is like. That would be a metaphysical claim. And you might have already recognized the radical embodied cognitive science by Anthony Cimero in his homonymous 2009 book with the underlying tenets of dynamic systems theory and ecological psychology, opposing computational theories of the mind, including predictive processing, I would say, in the sense that predictive processing is the latest wave in trying to reconciliate computationalism with embodied cognition and eventually embracing a series of theories of mental representation. So, I start with complexity. Traditionally, we consider it in quantitative and qualitative terms. It's just an explosion of musical parameters in multiple relations between them, inviting multiple paths, as Brian Fernihau puts it, for example, for the performer. But to that definition, which refers to the graphic phenomenon of notation, I want to add two qualifications. First that complexity is dynamic. Complexity changes over the time of learning and of uh, performing. We can see that traditionally in annotation practices by interpreters. Everybody needs to scramble and change the notation in some way. But with today's means and technologies, we can actually have a, a real-time change of the notation. The second is that complexity is grounded. Complexity is not a phenomenon on paper. It's not abstract symbols, but they do refer 
to multimodal realities, to real physical energies. And those two characteristics, dynamicism and groundedness, invite about interaction. So, this is a first example, a notorious piano piece by Brian Fernihau, Lemma Icon Epigram, which exemplifies these quantitative and qualitative aspects of notation. Whereas in the second example, it's a differently complex situation. It's a passage by Mists by Yanis Xenakis. You can see the notes distributed in space as if they were the molecules of a gas. Xenakis explicitly uses a Brownian movement to model his uh, piece and many other pieces in his output. And they've shown in previous work how this non-internalizable image is actually being processed in an embodied way by analyzing several embodied layers, layers of physical coarticulation like fingers, hand grasps, uh, the arm movements which connect the individual hand grasps and eventually resulting into linear trajectories. And putting all that together, I create a tablature for contemporary, very complex music, which constitutes essentially a state space of affordances for the pianist. And the pianist, I claim, navigates in such spaces, interpretation being the outcome of this navigation, embodied navigation process. And that's a simple example. I've made models for much more complex situations. Eventually, the groundedness of notation to physical energies can today uh, be registered and analyzed in the form of multimodal data. And that's a foretaste of the JESTCOM system whereby we have uh, several modalities like image, sound, MIDI, uh, capacitive sensing, and above all, acceleration. And we can synchronize and analyze all that, but I'll refer to that later. Now, to come to representation, before I explain how I mean what I say when I <laughs> utter playing without mental representations, a few distinctions. Firstly, Chimero, 2009, uses the distinction between representations causally coupled to their targets, that is, to what they represent, as opposed to decouplable representations, decouplable either temporarily for a very short amount of time or even totally absent, in order to give a taxonomy of theories of mental representation. So the traditional theories like uh, Millikan's, uh, for example, teleological theory or Merkman and Dietrich functional theory of representation fall to the first uh, category, causally coupled representations. They have to be always in contact with the target and here Chimero gives the analog of a frog uh, that follows a fly. So the way that a frog effectively, effectively tracks the fly gives a model for those very traditional theories of, of representation. And that's opposed to theories like Brian Cantwell Smith's theory of registration, something to count as a representation must be totally absent. Or, uh, for example, the emulation theory by Rick Grush, which involves predictive uh, processing. Interestingly enough, Chimero is modeling those mental representations through coupled oscillators. And that's quite tricky because coupled oscillators are an external representation of the mental representation. So this strategy used by Chimero is used also by other dynamicists, but by representationalists as well themselves because representationalists will claim that, okay, those dynamic systems still do have things in them, parts of them which can be termed representations. So why not have a unified theory of representations? Whereas Chimero admits that, yeah, there might be things like representations, but they are redundant because essentially we can have a dynamic explanation based on differential equations. So why use representations? So this is a bit of a dead end for me, you know? We start uh, being on shaky ground. The same applies to a, a different distinction between structural representations and receptors by Ramsey. Both of those entities are causally coupled representations, but structural representations exhibit an isomorphic or homomorphic 
functional relationship to the target, whereas, whereas receptors are just triggers, detectors, or relays in relation to something in connectionist architectures. So here Morgan comes and criticizes Ramsey by showing first that receptors are indeed uh, representations in themselves. There is no real distinction between them, but the most important and very illuminating point by Morgan is that the criteria we usually uh, employ in order to differentiate between uh, 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 structural representations and receptors or different coupled oscillator models are making the distinction between mental and external representation entirely collapse. In other words, and as I have very often seen in reading those theories of mental representation, dynamicists take representations as affordances and computationalists very often ascribe uh, some characteristics of representations to affordances. So I think it's very important to clear out this confusion here. It's a different thing to have an external representation and a mental representation should be given its own space, which probably refers to very high reasoning levels, uh, episodic memory, mental imagery, etc. Two final distinctions between static and dynamic representation. A very good uh, uh, example is predictive processing for the dynamicity of representation, although predictive processing also posits object concepts and theoretical entities in the beginning, but those forward models or inverse models do uh, refer to future states of a system. And eventually, the distinction between symbolic and grounded representation. We have to be very, very careful when we equate symbolism, symbols, with representations, because the most strict computationalists, and I've been reading this, Negarestani, 2018, after Sellers, uh, posit that actually si real symbolism is non-representational. For something to be symbol, it has to be able to be abstracted from reality and combined in formal languages. So no, symbols are not representations. Very careful. Uh, as opposed to someone like Glenber with uh, hindexical hypothesis or Barsalu with model and model symbols, they try to address the symbol grounding problem. How do abstract symbols refer to reality? So just to make a sum of all that, we have the target causally coupled to a mental representation. We have an optional target, a decouplable or absent target that shows to a mental representation. And then this system of a target and a mental representation is externalized into a system of oscillators for dynamicists. Dynamicists claim that, okay, this external representation can replace the system of the mental representation. Representationalists claim the opposite, that in this system, this external system, we still do have representations. And how does that help us understand and uh, re-notate our musical communicative chain from an absent music that the composer codifies in a score to be decodified by a performer in the real music that is being performed? We can notate it like that, traditionally. A target, an absent target, which gives rise to a mental representation, which gives rise to external representation, to a score, which gives rise to mental representations on the part of the performer, which results in a music. That's the classical model of interpretation, understanding the composer's intentions. I posit that actually our main concern is the score, because the score is used as the interface that substitutes both the system of the absent target in the beginning with the mental representation and renders obsolete the mental representations on the part of the performer before the music. And that can happen through an optimization of the score with adaptive transformations, what I'm going to show through the system. So I essentially embrace a rather narrower understanding of mental representation as a decouplable functional homomorphism after Morgan or a stand-in for parts not reliably present in the system after Hogeland, representational general 1991, a very important text. 
In that sense, the score is a causally coupled, external, dynamic, and grounded representation that allows direct perception of affordances, dynamic adaptation to optimize this perception, and eventually driving action without representation. Something that resonates well with Rowland's environmentalism 1991, he does away completely with even the notion of external representation. He talks about information bearing structures in the environment. Cognition is manipulating and rearranging the external uh, structures. And thus in performing any given task, the more we process externally, the less we need to process in the brain internally. And that's more efficient and more ecologically um, uh, uh, sound. Coming to the gesture. Here are several uh, devices we used for capturing different data. Max MSP patches that combine the multimodal data with notation and those sensors I was wearing on my wrists. The GESTCOM is an acronym for gesture cutting through textual complexity, so how we can process notation with gesture. Developed the TIRCOM 2014 with the significant contribution of Dominique Faubert at GRAM. The IRCAM team is Interaction Sans Musique Mouvement uh, under, uh, under Frédéric Bevilacqua and after in Strasbourg and Paris as well. The goals on the domain of representation and interaction as far as representation is concerned to create malleable, dynamic, objective, personalized scores archiving the longitudinal learning trajectory in interaction to reduce the information, to reduce the complexity, but at the same time to augment the complexity, including multimodal data, signals, images, videos, all of that, and eventually to achieve a gestural control of notation in real time. Four modules, recording data, analyzing, processing notation offline, and real-time applications. The data recorded are MIDI, audio, Kinect video, linear and angular acceleration in uh, 12 axes, and touch keys data, those are capacitive sensing on the keys, uh, so we can create some sort of blueprint of the positions of the fingers on the keys. You can see here the patch for recording and synchronizing, you can see the different dimensions of the sensors, and all that is coordinated through an object at Max MSP, which is called MUBU, multiple buffer. One can download it for free at the uh, IRCAM forumnet. And here is how it looks like. What's wrong? Sorry about that. So let's try again. So that's the beginning of Mists by Kusunaki. Uh, here is a video. Here are the sensors in a dynamic representation, audio, the sensors in a static representation, MIDI, and capacity sensing. You can see that. This is chunked, this is articulated in several segments, and those segments represent essentially a syntax of gesture, which has occurred, has uh, been computed through a mapping of movement to sound. We have developed an envelope for every pianistic gesture, which includes preparation of the movement, attack, displacement, and release. And on the basis of that uh, envelope, of that syntax, we have been able to make a mapping to notation and thus process notation. Complexity reduction and multimodal augmentation were the targets. That happened automatically from the MIDI file. We get a reduced proportional space notation 
and then that's command li line tools developed by Dominic Faber. And then we can represent the embodied layers and end up with a skeleton for, for gesture. So you see the first page of Ernie Ho and how this is reduced to a very, very simple image. Then these images can be used for more uh, representations, multimodal ones like that one here. So that's, that's a very rich example. I normally wouldn't uh, use so much information. Or real-time applications. Motion following is the main idea. We record the gesture and we follow the variations in the gesture. So if we record the skeleton of the gesture, then we can add interpretation. We can, as we would say traditionally, we can add physical information. So essentially, I will have to skip a few things. Uh, in the domain of representation, we have registration of real physical energies as opposed to mere symbolic, monitoring of the learning process, longitudinal archiving in both physical and symbolic form, dynamic as opposed to static representation, externalization of the internal mental processes, extension of traditional annotation practices, reproducibility, communicability of the learning process, adaptation of the notation. In interaction, simplification of notation, proliferation of the representation and augmented multimodal feedback, real-time control of the representation, effective transformation of the notation into a part of the instrument, into an interface, radical embodied paradigm with contingent use for mental representations, direct perception of notation as a signal, dynamics of entrainment, alignment, and sensory motor learning in the interaction with symbolic information. So external dynamic and grounded representation can render mental representation obsolete through incremental and radical innovation. Thank you. You can access all the materials in the previous slide. It's all online. If you Google my name, you can find all of that, including this presentation, which I will upload after the conference is over. Thank you very much for your questions. Thank you. I um, really applaud the way you handled the complexity bit by bit. Uh, it made it certainly uh, much easier for me. So um, it reminded me a bit about the origins of scores. They were monks and they made like little drawings. Yeah. So they externalized something. And at some point somebody said, uh, well, let's just put lines and so on and so on. So they had to remember less and just read more. Um, mm -hmm. This is not exactly the same, but uh, in some way it is. And then no. my question is, and then my question is, there is a, there are limits for our cognition. Um, I could see how much complexity you were um, kind of chunking, but then I felt completely kind of daunted by how much more complexity there was that I could actually read or plan to read. How, what are your um, kind of, real life applications of this incremental complexation of, of reading um, besides the theoretical bit and the, and the technical bit, which I applaud. It's a very good question. It's a matter of design of the medium afterwards. So uh, I have another example which I didn't show, which was a very simple score following. So essentially you can have very, very little bits of information, a cursor and the signal and have someone start learning with very, very little information and eventually have an adaptation of the score as the learning goes on. Essentially what I have in mind for the future, it's not there yet, we are working on that, but what we have in mind is to have a system which will work a bit like the VAT governor. It will be self-regulated in the complexity. So if you have someone who starts, let's say, learning note by note, you know, like that, the, the system would chunk everything in larger entities so that the system would push him to think a bit in larger entities. And if someone, let's say, was a very good sight reader that, but who becomes a bit uh, uh, sort of sloppy with detail, the system would make him focus a bit more on smaller things. And so the system would be adapted 
to the aptitude of the performer. And that's, a, I think, a very legit program r right now in artificial intelligence. We don't want machines that uh, essentially will substitute humans or replace them, but we want machines that learn how to work better with humans and how to help humans learn better themselves. So you have, essentially, I haven't mentioned it, but you have this an activist idea of Varela, of a system, you know, a feedback circle from the system to the individual. And I don't know if that asks the, the question, but it's a question of design, but uh, we still... At the moment, I have to say that uh, this, um, um, okay, this in-score is essentially a very, very uh, versatile and flexible system for putting together anything, like scores, images, videos, signals. You have to program them. So I'm programming the scores, I'm putting all the objects together, but it's not something that one needs to be an absolute expert to do. I think, I mean, I used to teach it in my uh, students in the university, like second year students. So it's something that one can do. And then, you know, you have, you can have representations like that, but also very simple things. So it's a matter of design, it's not. Uh, Other questions? Um, yeah, I was just wondering, uh, I mean, does this completely remove any mental representation? Because, I mean, this pre-processing or even analyzing the data from th this one performer, which is then used for other performers, there, there is still a mental pre representation there uh, that feeds into the system uh, that's maybe at a different place because there's an interpretation of the score which, which creates a new new score. Mm -hmm. uh, well, I mean, here you analyze like one person already playing the piece who has already made a mental representation and then you use the data gathered from that to create a new score, like a new mm -hmm. uh, external representation. But, uh, but there is an interpretation happening there. I think in what you're asking, uh, there is a confusion between mental processing or mental activation and mental representation. Of course, someone is using their brains all the time. <laughs> I, I wouldn't say that there is no mental processing. Of course, someone's play needs to give motor commands and needs to do several things. But I claim that according to the definition of mental representation I gave, this is not mental representation. That, that's a claim. I also, I also can admit that, you know, several of those elements can then be memorized, be representable, be as mental images, or I can draw them, you know, from memory. Of course, I can do all that. I've played most of this repertoire, I've played by heart. I'm talking about performance with a coupled external representation. And in that sense, the claim is that, yes, uh, you outsource what is happening, would normally happen internally to an external source. That's, that's the claim. That's why I'm talking about contingent roles for representation, not uh, how they say it. Uh, yeah, they are not existentially annihilated. <laughs> they, they become contingent. Okay. Okay, we have to move on to our next talk, uh, but thank you so much. Thank you.